everyone. And uh, welcome again to, um, to another CPIC session, webinars on how our schools are responding to, uh, to the crisis that we're all facing. And uh, great to see all these faces again. Um, my remarks can be really brief because I'm going to turn this over to, uh, to Violet Cole in just a second. Um, I'm Steve Zimmerman. I was until last Tuesday uh, the director of uh, this organization, Coalition of Public Independent Charter Schools. Um, I'm telling you before I announce, uh, uh, announce it more broadly that um, I wound up stepping down last Tuesday because I accepted a job as an interim executive director of Academy of the City Charter School in Woodside, New York, not too far from where I live, but right here in Queens, uh, in the area most affected by the COVID crisis. Um, so uh, this is a, an assignment that's, that's challenging and exciting for me. Um, didn't expect it to happen, and I couldn't do two things at once, but I'm we're, we're so lucky that we've got you know, Violet and Edward to, to step in and just uh, and, and, and run things right now. Couldn't be, uh, uh, couldn't have two, two better people at the helm of this organization. So um, I'm now in the same club with a lot of you guys. I've suddenly found myself a, a school leader in crisis. Imagine that. So one of the things that I'm dealing with, as you are is, too, is um, how, we're taking care of, uh, how we're taking care of our teachers. Uh, our teachers, half of our, more than half of our teachers, are homeschoolers. Their, their lives are beyond full. Uh, I don't know how they manage all that's on their plate, but um, now that I'm a school leader, I'm, I'm trying to help them navigate that as best I can, and that's what this is all about. So um, enough for me. Oh, yes, um, I'm not going away. Um, uh, I just, I'm on the, uh, uh, Violet and Edward and I meet every single morning, you know, for, for half an hour and go, go, go over stuff. Um, I'm not, you know, I've stepped down as director. I'm not leaving this organization. I'm leaving it officially. It's in great hands, but uh, it's not like I'm going away. So, um, you know, I'll be seeing all you guys uh, often, but not in, not in the same capacity, at least for the time being. Well, I, like many of you, have my hands over full being a school leader. So that's it. That's it. I'm going to turn this over to, uh, to Violet now. And uh, thanks, thanks to iTutor for sponsoring uh, today's event. Can't do it without you guys. Good to see everyone. Um, Let's hear Violet. Awesome. Thanks, Steve. That was great. Um, so thank you guys all for coming here for another week of our webinars. Um, they've been really great these past few weeks. Um, so I just wanted to remind you guys we're starting our membership drive for next year's membership next week. So if you've been enjoying these webinars, please consider giving us your support for another year. Um, so we're going to just start off. I want to thank iTutor for sponsoring this virtual meeting. And we're going to hear from Paul Sheffield to tell us a little bit more about what iTutor does. All right. It looks like Paul and I are playing with some Zoom meta space within a space classroom within a Zoom meeting, which is always an exciting task. As Paul gets that figured out, I'll just say hi to everyone. My name is Haley Spearbauer. I'm the Director of Education Services here at iTutor. Um, Paul is our Senior Education Director. He actually started as a teacher on our platform, but has taken it much further. Um, so you can hear me now? I'm sorry. Yeah, Paul, there we go. <laughs> I apologize. I apologize. Can everybody see the screen? On there? Yeah. Okay. All right. Good. Perfect. So Again, I'm terribly sorry about that. It wasn't unmuting for some reason, but so yes, my name is Paul Sheffield. I am the Senior Education Director at iTutor, and we are about a decade old as a company. Um, we have partnerships with over 750 school districts across the country, and we also work with numerous gear up and upward bound trio programs as well. Um, so what you're looking at right now, and I figured out what, what better way to present than to bring you directly into our virtual classroom. This is our safe and secure virtual classroom, and it is designed specifically for K through 16 instruction. So without further ado, I will give you, take you on a little tour of what we have to offer. So down here on the lower left-hand side, we have our chat box, and our chat feature allows for me to communicate with the students, obviously, for what it's used for is just through chat. So if I have a classroom full of students and I say, everybody, what is three plus three? And as you can see, it comes through as six, and six is correct. Nice job, Haley. Thank you. 
So there's also here a, the ability to chat privately. So if you have students who don't wanna, if they're worried about their answer, they're worried about the other students in the classroom seeing the answer, they can chat directly with you. And this is, does not allow for the students to chat with one another. It's only between the educator and the student. On the left-hand side here is how you're able to upload everything directly to the virtual classroom. So it can be a YouTube video. The whiteboard is, you have the content. There's also a code editor, a media player, and you can save everything to a PDF. So we have right now our class schedule. I have all my tools on the left-hand side. And if I am working with my students and I say, okay, boys and girls, we just finished our circle time. Can Haley please check off that we completed circle time? And Haley can make her check. And that lets me know that we have completed our circle time this morning. Across the top here, you can see that I have a recorded session. So every single session is recorded, which allows for unlimited playback for the students, depending on their age level, if they're prepping for an exam, if they wanted to go back and review a previous session. And it also is for accountability with our educators. Our educators are all state certified educators. They go through trainings throughout the year with our academics team and they're observed three times a year as well. This right here is my microphone, my camera. Um, I have a timer, lets me know how much time is left in the session. One of my favorite parts on this, being a former educator, is the polling piece. It allows me to easily push out a question to all of the students to check for understanding very quickly. So I just push this out to Haley. She receives it and checks off and it lets me know that it was completed. We also have a way to change our layout and we also have a screen share feature, which just like we're doing on Zoom right now, would allow me as an educator to share the screen with my students if it's not something I wanted them to work on specifically. So as we go into our layout change, the layout change will allow for me to have a whole screen. So if I am going to show my YouTube video on sunflowers, nice little music for you today. Also, again, going back to that poll feature, while this is going on, I can push out another question to make sure that the students in the class are, this is all in the way, sorry. As another quick check for understanding, I push out this question for what do sunflowers need to grow? It's answered correctly. I know that it's done. I can end the poll. So that is a really quick look into our virtual classroom and how it works. Uh, we also, the, so our services that we offer, we offer one certified educator to one student. We also do small group instruction of one to four, and we do full class instruction of one to many. And this can be used and is customized based on the needs of the school. So the way that it would work is you would speak with us, you would let us know what you need, what you're looking for, and we would work out a customized program that fit the needs of you, your staff, and your students. The other service that we offer is our, this platform, which we call our Virtual Academy, is where it's your teachers, your students, specifically designed for you. So you get your own branded piece that allows you to work together with your students virtually. And on that one is where, again, you're using your teachers with your students. We also have our proprietary test prep. We do SAT, ACT, AccuPlacer regions if you're in New York State, uh, TSI if you are in Texas. And there is also on the screen for students, another way just for quick communication is a hand raise feature. So if I go through my different layouts and I will bring us back to where we can have multiple students on the screen here and bring it back to the regular screen and the student on the other end can raise their hand if they need to, letting me know that they have a question. I get a little bit of a notification up here and it says demo raised their hand. So there's different ways for students to communicate based on their needs as well. And I know we are in limited time. I could spend forever talking about this. I love this program. I was a teacher in public schools for 18 years in New York State. I taught on this platform for three years and then here I am now uh, doing this because I really truly believe that this is the wave of the future and it's really a tool that's going to bring students and give them everything that they need and really, really, you know, being able to customize it, like I said in the beginning, to fit their needs is, is super important. So that is my spiel on our platform and how it works. My contact information is up there and I will end there. Thank you so much for your time. I genuinely appreciate it. Hope everybody's staying safe. Thank you so much, Paul. That was great. Um, so we will have a resource page on our website um, with Paul's contact info if anyone's interested and wants to learn more. Um, so next we're going to turn to hear from some school leaders and teachers. Um, we're gonna form out this, we'll have three presentations and then we'll have some time for questions and then we'll have four more presentations. 
Um, but if you guys want to type questions in the chat box as we go, I'll keep an eye on them and I can ask the presenters during the Q&A. Um, so we're going to start by going to Rhode Island to hear from Rob Pilkington, who's been with us since the very beginning from Village Green Virtual Charter School. Go for oh. it, Rob. Well, thank you, Violet. Is my sound okay? Can you hear me all right? Perfect. Okay, thank you. Steve Zimmerman, say it ain't true. You're back to the eye of the storm, huh? Well, well, congratulations and, 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 and Godspeed to you, my brother. Uh, thank you, Violet. Thank you, Edward, for all, all you do at CPIX to provide such important continuity of community. It, it, you know, one of the things that the schools have been you know, very deliberate in during the closure time is, is to provide continuity of community to our students and our families. And certainly CPIX has provided that to the independent charter school community through all of your hard work. So thank you very much. And hello to all of my colleagues at VGV who have tuned in and Mrs. Pilkington from the Providence School Department. Hello, hello. And, and thank you so much for uh, all your hard work on behalf of the students of the school. So Village Green Virtual, um, we're a bricks and mortar virtual school. We were established in 2013 uh, as a Rhode Island State Charter School. We're an independent school. And our, essentially, our research question when we started the school as an R&D lab school was, uh, you know, can a curriculum that's used for mostly homeschooling and credit recovery, an asynchronous product, can that be rolled out in a synchronous way as a ubiquitous and single curriculum in a bricks and mortar environment to bring sort of a, a synchronous use to an asynchronous product through a true blended learning model. Uh, we, uh, um, we've been doing it now for seven years and it has been an unbelievably successful time and experience for us as a group of professionals to do uh, some extraordinary work with, uh, with some great online curriculum tools. We, at VGV have a very typical day for students. It's a bricks and mortar high school where we have an attendance requirement. Our commissary serves 350 meals a day. Uh, we have 23 teachers for our 225 students. The learner experience is one that uses a 100% online digital product. So when we transition to crisis management, distance learning, closure school, we were very well set up for complete continuity of teaching and learning. What was different and uh, the subtitle of our, of our closure plan is new behaviors, same skills, attitudes, and dispositions. Because all of the things that we do as a blended learning school, as an, an e-learning school, and as a virtual school during the day, we had to now roll out in a new distance learning format. So, you know, true distance learning format. So uh, a, a lot of the behaviors of how to get that done were, were brand new for us, even though we were a virtual school and had been open for seven years. So during closure and crisis management, what we knew from the very early on was that the continuity of community and preservation of student mental health was paramount. And we knew that that could be achieved by, by successful teaching and learning. We were very concerned about stability, about sustainability at the very outset. We were all hopeful that closure would not, you know, last as long as it has. And, and certainly, you know, our governor said that Rhode Island schools are closed until, well, for the rest of the year. Uh, Monday is March 4th, which is Rhode Island Independence Day. It's also, it also marks the halfway point of our distance learning and, and, and closure plan. So we are very much in the midst of that now. And we knew that continuity for, the, for our students and for sustainability, that what we needed to do was to keep the connections alive and keep the progress going for our kids. As, as, our, as Village Green Virtual School Principal Rochelle Baker always says, happy students are successful students. And we had to find a way to change our behaviors as adults in order to keep our students successful and to keep them going and to keep that esprit de corps up. So very early on, the, the admin team understood that in crisis management and in crisis, immediate action on new conditions was needed and decisiveness and inventiveness was to be our new method of leadership. 
you know, we've always been a very trusting school. I, I a, a, a very, very, very early on, I said, you know, my, you know, the, the greatest tool I have in my toolbox as the school leader of a bricks and mortar virtual school with an all digital curriculum, which is highly personalized with 16 different pathways and all the, all the, the, the different ways that you can roll out e-courseware, uh, we would have to trust our teachers more than ever because things don't appear to be as traditional as we knew in the past. I mean, formerly in bricks and mortar textbook based schools, I could walk down the corridor, look into classrooms, see the, see, the two, see, see the students sitting in rows, taking notes, teachers working at boards, and I'd say, well, that's, that's, that's teaching and learning going on right there. And, and teaching and learning took on such a different specter in the school that sometimes it was a little off-putting, and, and it was like, you know, why, why is there a group of two? Why, is there, why, why aren't there 10? What about the ratio here? And we dispensed with all those trappings of expectations of bricks and mortar textbook-based schools and said, we need to develop a, a, an ethos of trust in this school or else we're not going to be able to be successful. So we've always been a very trusting school due to the nature uh, of, of, of the teaming philosophy and of the all digital curriculum. And that, that trusting paradigm has been accelerated to great extents during the time of, of, distance, of distance learning and closure. Now, this is, our, this is our closure plan. We were asked by the state of Rhode Island on Thursday, March 12th, to begin to devise a, uh, a closure prep plan. On Friday the 13th, at about two o'clock in the afternoon, the governor came on and said, we're closed starting on Monday. And the demand to have the plan done was accelerated. So just, just to give you a, a very quick snippet, teachers must use their skills in new ways. This is in the redefine, re part of our, uh, it's, a, it's a bit about the mission statement and a closing. Teachers must use their skills in new ways to engage students and to keep learning happening. Administration must also develop new behaviors in managing people remotely. The crisis management, which we are currently engaging in, calls for a set of skills which, which others thought we were going to, be, which others thought we were aiming, aiming to establish initially. However, they are in fact new to VGV as they are new to all of us. A new set of schedules will have to be produced by the teams in order to facilitate distance learning. It is without question that it is the work of the teachers which will make this distance learning experiment a success or a failure. Our students are all able e-learners, and there is nothing in this experiment which is a new facet for us on the curricular side. Where we will fail or succeed is in the robust connections the teachers keep with their students. So very early on, we knew that, that the success of what we were going to attempt during the distance learning period of, of forced closure was going to be in, in the close relationship that the teachers were keeping with the kids, that that was the essential DNA of success in this new environment. The teacher was, was front and center in the success and in the connection with the kids. So what did we do? What does this all mean? It, it means that immediately, the school put into to, to action a, a, a set of new paradigms. First, all teachers got a $200 a week raise. April 30th paycheck had five weeks of $200 raise embedded in it because our teachers, first of all, teaching is, is not, a, a, is, is not a, a, a lucrative business by any means, but a lot of our teachers also work part-time jobs and during, during, the, uh, 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 during the stay at home order and during the closure, folks have lost income. Even though they might not have lost their school income, they've still lost income. And they're also working harder and they're working more hours. So, so the first thing we did was give every teacher a $200 a week raise. Schedules. D generally, ad administration and the academic dean has a, has a real hand in the building of schedules, but we knew that in a paradigm or in a situation where any time, any place, any path, any pace was going to be expand, expanded to even what we didn't, what, to a greater extent than we even thought. Um, we needed to have the teachers be able to build schedules which took into account the customer need and how the market spoke to us. So it was important for administration not to believe that they knew the rhythm of the day to define a schedule, but for the teachers to continually, in an iterative process, rebuild their schedules according to the rhythms of the day 
that the customer, the kid, was forcing upon them. So we have teachers building schedules depending upon the age of their kids. The older kids have a, have a stranger schedule than the younger kids. But nonetheless, though, the rhythm of the day and the depiction of the, depiction of the teacher day is a purely authentic act because the, the, teaming, the teams in the schedules are, the teams are in complete control of their schedules and the goal is to have them be as authentic as possible representing their day. So we have teachers working from eight until God, uh, long, long, long hours. And, and the teachers have built into time, into those schedules, times when they have uh, the need for downtime. So scheduling was completely given up to the, to the teams. Uh, adding content, we have a canned curriculum. And in order to keep this sustainable, teachers needed to be able to infuse our e-courseware with inventive content that they came up with to keep everything fresh and to keep everybody on their toes and to keep everybody thinking and learning. We needed to open up and liberalize access to the curriculum for the teachers so that they could infuse it with their own content, which is something that we had always shied away from because we want to have, we want to have fidelity to curriculum in this environment. Job number one is sustainability, and that's done through creative means, and, and the teachers have access to adding creative content to our curriculum. Our grade book, we had a grade book and, and a grading system that was really built for a bricks and mortar environment, and that had to be completely changed for a distance learning environment, because expectations are completely different. So, so we changed the way we, 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 we look at grades around school with regard to the delivery of content from kids to teachers. Um, Professional development and support. We, we, we have professional learning units and recertification requirements that our teachers are under the gun for because we have a whole bunch of teachers who, who are going to be recertified this summer and they have to keep their professional license. And it's harder to do this work when you're not face to face. It just simply is. So we developed a whole new set of online modules for teachers, which again uh, can be done on a, on a flex time basis. And, and it's, a, it's a simple streamlined system because the school and the administration is committed to allowing every teacher to get their PLUs unfettered because at the end of the day, they need to keep their license. And, and we had to deviate from our professional development plan. Distance learning report card. We did something called a, a 21st century report card, which was a companion to our academic report card. And it really talked about the soft skills, this is the, you know, the old scan stuff, the, 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 the digital learner piece. What, how, how does the student comport themselves in a bricks and mortar virtual school environment as basically a, 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 a kid at work now. And so we had a 21st century report card that was a companion to our academic report card. And again, in, in the first week of closure school, we deployed a brand new distance learning report card as a companion to the academic report card. And teachers had the unfettered ability to use those to report to parents um, on any day at any time for any reason. And they were also viewed now, and this as efficiencies, not just efficiencies. So the report card was built as a congratulatory advice, just not on a, hey, you know, you've got to pick up your game in this area device. Uh, so all of these new behaviors were instituted in week one, uh, because in the support of teachers, admin had to shift its thinking with regard to decisiveness, immediacy, and, and the ability to think first what do the teachers need in an unfettered and trusted manner to be able to do their best with the kids? Because at the end of the day, all of this is either going to, is either going to live or it's going to crash. It will crater if we do not support that basic DNA of, of uh, distance learning, which is the, 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 the deep relationship the teachers have with, with, with kids. And we're being very successful so far. And I'm just going to close in saying that attendance is, is better I mean, than, than in school. We, we are, we're doing mid-90s to upper 90% in engagement and attendance. And we are as productive or a little bit actually more productive with regard to course completion, activities, time on task, because it's all, it's all time and date stamped through the LMS. And, and our kids are producing work to a somewhat greater degree than they, than they are in the bricks and mortar environment. So, um, you know, in, in closing, our plan was new behaviors, uh, same skills, attitudes, and dispositions. But in retrospect, what we've really done is, is, is to 
is to use this as an opportunity to, to free the environment and, and to say, you know, what is it that the teachers need to keep this great program we have going as well as possible and to also keep our kids as feeling as, as successful as they can to help get them through this really, really, really weird time. Um, and I, I just want to like close by saying that in a very odd way, Village Green Virtual is going to emerge post-closure as a stronger organization than we started out. And that is because of the collective work that administration, is, and, and that administration has done to develop immediacy and decisiveness on new tools which the teachers can use to increase their robust communication and, and connection with kids in order to keep everybody safe and sane. Thank you, Violet. Thank you, Edward. Thank you, Steve. Thanks, Rob. That was great. Thank you. Um, okay, so now we're going to turn to another school that's been with us since the beginning, um, Arts and College Preparatory Academy. And we're lucky enough to hear from Amanda, who's a high school principal, as well as Tara, who is a counselor. So we're going to get both of their perspectives on teacher well-being. So go for it. Thank you. Hi, can everybody hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you. Great. Can anybody hear me? I can hear you, Tara. Okay, great. <laughs> so um, thank you for allowing us to present today. Um, we're talking about strategies for staff self-care, but this has also been kind of an enjoyable experience that we've been able to work together and create this short presentation um, and kind of break up our day in new ways because we're finding our days kind of look the same, at least geographically. Um, so this is a great opportunity to just do something different and growth-minded. Um, a lot of my day right now feels like it's taken up by just trying to like tread the water and kind of the, the next step. So um, we are from the Arts and College Preparatory Academy in Columbus, Ohio, like Violet said. And we're talking today about strategies for um, encouraging, supporting staff self-care. Uh, so we're going to be sharing this. Um, I'm talking more from the administrative perspective. And then Tara is talking more from the counseling perspective, which overlaps both into student and staff well-being. So we want to operate on the assumption that um, our students are best served when our teachers are at their best. And so if we can support our teachers at their best, ultimately that will have payoffs. And intrinsically, it's worth doing for their own sake as well, the, the, sake, the sake, pardon me, of our staff. And we're also looking at st self, s staff self-care strategies as um, the responsibility of everybody, kind of as of us as a whole, of individual staff members um, and s smaller groups of staff too, that we all kind of have a role in that. Um, I'll turn it over to you, Tara. Okay, self-care can sometimes be one of those words that you think is kind of like artsy or not, um, not something that everybody can do easily. And that's sometimes because self-care has a label to it. So the important thing is defining what your own self-care is. Um, there's some ways of checking in with yourself and cult cultivating the awareness that you need. One of my yoga instructors also said that um, self-care is what you're doing for yourself when no one's looking. So thinking about um, self-care as not being selfish, but it is needed. And a, a central part of that is self-compassion. So when you're thinking about what this looks like, which it can vary from day to day, it can change um, from different people, might need different things. Maybe one of those days you're not going to feel like doing what you think is self-care and also giving yourself the grace to know like maybe I didn't, maybe that was my part of my self-care was not doing this thing. Um, and so there's a big piece of that awareness in yourself with that. Thanks, Tara. So we can talk about what self-care is, but then we need to share that with our staff as well as our students. But for today, our real goal is to focus on giving you some ideas of our own practices of making self-care a priority for your staff members. And then you can extend some of these practices to students as well. 
Um, I included uh, kind of part of my own self-definition of self-care here in the photograph. This is me and my son spending time together, which we're getting to do a lot more of. We've currently started um, rereading Harry Potter and that has been self-care for me and I think for him as well. So we're talking though about making self care a priority for the entire school. And there are a few strategies that we've been using and implementing that we wanna share with you. One of those is folding in questions and sharing kind of stories and strategies about how we're engaging self care and doing that organically in larger and smaller staff meetings and being really implicit and intentional about not only defining what self care is and coming to a common understanding of what that means, but also valuing it and communicating to your staff that even though we have very high expectations and sometimes the teaching profession itself doesn't always lend itself to, to self care, that, that we do care about that and that we want them to have a balanced life. So one practice that we've done, especially um, has been conducive in the digital world is to ask staff members to share in the chat bar one of their favorite self-care strategies. And in fact, you could do that right now if you wanted to and just kind of see how that works. And you might get ideas um, that from another person to try something new um, and that can be helpful. And it also just a, a good way to put self-care on the front of the brain. Um, by talking about self-care, by asking those intentional questions, that's, I think, one of the most important ways that we can show our staff that we value their own well-being. Uh, we're also, we've been engaging in holistic one-on-one -on -one check-ins. In the past three weeks, I've met individually with every member of the teaching staff. Uh, sometimes I've pulled in our, our instructional coach as well. But part of those 30-minute to one-hour meetings, depending on the needs of the teachers, have always been how are you as a person and then having that moment for them to reflect on how am I as a person because many of our teachers are, are single and living alone and nobody might have asked that of them at least not that day or recently and the other thing is something that we're doing right now is looking to our school counselors for assistance, for input, for their expertise. And that's why I asked Tara to join in on this presentation for today. And thank you, Tara. Thank you. Okay, staff-wide wellness initiatives uh, can sound over, it can sound really um, burdensome, but one of the things that uh, we've really taken into account is that a lot of our staff members um, are already doing their wellness um, routines and it, it's sometimes really great to put that all together and create friendly competitions um, that hold each other accountable. So for ACPA, what we ended up doing, myself and the dance uh, instructor, we worked together to figure out what might be a really universal way of um, tracking wellness and creating a competition that had a tangible reward, uh, meaning we would track it and there would be a reward for those that, that passed it, or not passed, but that achieved their goals. Um, and it's time specific. The first time we did it, we did a 55 day challenge and that was just too long. So figuring out um, what would work for your staff and then getting staff involvement. Um, we created team names for the first one, which seemed to be that friendly competition piece. Um, and then the, then we realized doing more individual, but like as a collective group could probably help um, with our staff. So um, uh, there's a resource on here that um, we found to be really helpful because a lot of people do a lot of different things for their own fitness. It's not just step counting. And if you're somebody like me that doesn't really even have a Fitbit, you're not really counting your steps as much. Um, so this is a resource that converts all activities that you do into steps. So if you're mowing the yard, it tells how many steps you've taken for per minute. If you're doing yoga, how many steps you've taken per minute. If you're playing with your kids, um, you will be able to, to track that. So it re it's really helpful in being able to determine that. Um, and then some of the other things that um, are ideas that we have not yet implemented is tracking individual goals. If you create your own individual goals and then creating a a place for everybody to be able to hold 
that person accountable um, by making sure that you're um, achieving your individual goals, whether that be a fitness goal or a nutrition goal or something that you consider to be part of your wellness. Um, and then the group fitness opportunities for staff that we have, we're fortunate enough to have a, one of our visual art teachers is a yoga instructor. So during our professional development days, sometimes she'll host a, an, um, in, at the school, she'll host a chance for us to do a yoga class before all of our professional development starts for the day. And that's really helpful. So if you have teachers and you have those resources, being able to utilize that can really be incorporated into the culture uh, and add to that self-care. Okay, um, encouraging work-life balance. This is another negative connotation. I've heard that if you have work-life balance, sometimes that can be perceived as you're not really taking your job seriously. And um, if that's the case, that, that's, that tends to be, well, the United States is largely work-focused. And so that's one of the challenges we're having as we're sitting here and figuring out how to balance our work and life when we're literally in the same place. And many of you probably have children and you have that extra added piece of being the teacher at the same time as doing work. And this, so there's all this, it, it's complicated. Um, so what we started thinking about, I started thinking about the all work and no play makes Jack a doll boy when I was uh, thinking of this. And it's not sustainable that way. That's why self-care is so important. And so at least for me, um, I have a set hour that I am going to start work. I have a set place where I have determined is going to be my office, which is where I'm at right now. And these are the the parameters in which I set so that that is my work piece, even though I am in the space where the rest of my life is as well. And, and that is also um, the practicing the mindfulness and focusing on the present is really important because it's easy for our brains to wander and think about, oh, well, I have this to do when I get off the, this, this meeting, or I have to fix dinner in a few minutes. Um, and then when you're fixing dinner, thinking about, oh, I didn't do this when I was at work and now I have to do it. So really pushing your, challenging yourself to think about work when you're at work and think about other things, your personal life when you're not at work. And um, the last thing I have on here is something that we teach our students and we do it in a bell curve fashion. So the first thing we do, like stress can be in a bell curve and optimal stress is at that top of the bell curve. Um, but the first thing that we do when we start sliding down toward extreme stress is take away the things that bring us joy. And those are our activities of self care. So if you take away the things that bring you joy when you're feeling stressed, it's only going to keep you stressed. So put those things back in your life. So another practice that we're using is we do this anyway, but we've really ramped it up and seeking a lot of input from staff because with this transition to digital learning, and we're, we're literally making it up while we're in it. Um, I think we're moving to version 3.0 on Monday with some more amended expectations, but every time that we make a change to the structure of digital learning, I'm seeking out feedback from staff, both by going to staff members um, and just talking to them individually. That was one of the things I was doing in the one-on-ones too, is really looking at what's necessary and what's not necessary. Where can I give them, our staff members, some, some room, some freedom, um, and some room to engage in self-care and not work 24-7. Um, so I've also done Google surveys and then I analyzed that data um, based on intentional question asking and then I use that data along with student feedback and my kind of gathering of information of student needs to make adjustments that'll work better for students and for staff. Um, the one-on-one -on -one conversations I mentioned earlier have been really crucial to that and then some of our staff members especially we have a number of people who are perfectionists and that makes them incredible teachers. But the downfall of that is that every single thing I tell them to do, they have to do even more. And so sometimes in those one-on-ones, I learned very quickly that there are certain staff members I need to tell, you are doing a good job. You are doing this thing. It's hard. 
and now I need you to scale back some of what you're doing for yourself because I can see your lesson plans and your, your perfectionism, I think, is hurting you. And I've been really frank and really caring, but they needed to hear that from my mouth to be able to make changes for themselves. Um, meeting social needs, yeah, Tara. Yes, um, so you guys have probably heard of introversion or extroversion, and the idea of an introvert and extrovert doesn't have to do with being outgoing or whatever, it has to do with the amount of energy that being social takes from you. And so extroverts um, are able to recharge by being social, and introverts need their time to recharge by being by themselves. So it's important to meet your social needs, right, especially right now, um, it's because a lot of people that are introverts that need their alone time probably aren't getting that very much. But those that are extrovert are probably suffering because there's there's nobody else like inside unless they're inside the house that you're able to um, to socialize with. So some of the things that ACPA's put in place, we have a virtual teacher's lounge at lunchtime every day from 12 to 1. So anybody that wants to join uh, can. And it's not Obviously, it's not required, but it's just a chance for people to be social. Um, we do have small group meetings at the department level, the grade level, so that for those that maybe this teacher's lounge, if there's too many people in there, is too overwhelming, these are more small group focused. The one-on-one -on -one meetings, like Amanda was saying, um, is definitely great for somebody that is more introverted and wants to be able to still have that connection but not feel overwhelmed. Um, office hours with students are something that's important to have because our students are probably wanting to talk to you too. You miss them and it's just a great opportunity for that social piece. Uh, and then the structured day and breaks, as I mentioned in the um, encouraging the work-life balance, that piece is also really important to not over like inundate your day with all of the stuff that you have to do and then feel exhausted by the end of the day likewise um not planning nothing during the day which i'm sure none of you have um but making a light day when you're feeling like you want to take on that challenge we have two more quick points to share and then we'll we'll conclude so I've learned over the past few weeks as an administrator that I need to be more flexible than even usual. So when I'm gathering input, I have to be willing to make adjustments. I might have an idea in my mind of how I think this should be, but my mind needs to be changeable as I gather new evidence, um, which I think we're all experiencing now as we're learning by doing. One of the values that I've been embracing that I think has helped me to do this is putting quality over quantity and recognizing that scaling down is okay. And it's actually probably preferable for students, for staff, and for their well being. And then we talked already about the one on ones. So, the last piece, we wanted to share a couple of resources with you in addition to the resources earlier in the presentation. Um, I should probably be getting a paycheck from Down Dog for how much I've been um, advising people check it out. It is free for educators and students. It's a yoga app that's super customizable. So try that out if you want to. I swear that I'm not a representative of Down Dog, but I really do enjoy it. And that's something that we have made available. Um, I was able to kind of create a, an ACBA free version of it once an admin goes in and signs up. And then we've shared that with our whole staff and with all of our students as well. Um, just to give them a tool that is free and accessible to be able to engage in some of this self-care. Um, and then the National Association for Social Workers has a number of resources that could help to you, you to elaborate that definition of self-care and self-care strategies. Um, thank you so much for this time to present. Um, and please feel free to email us if you want more resources. Tara, I know that, that you and our other school counselor, Jen Roth, have created a lot of resources that could be applicable for students or staff, and we're happy to share. Yep, thank you. Thank you guys, that was really great. I really liked the little chat exercise too. It was fun to see what everyone does.
Um, so we're just going to keep going straight through and then we'll have a lot of time for questions at the end. So just a reminder, if you have questions, um, type them in the chat box. You guys can also directly chat with each other if you want to ask specific questions. Um, and next we are going to hear from Heather Robinson um, about supporting teachers in real time. So Heather, go for it. Good afternoon, everyone from um, sunny Jefferson, Georgia today. It is wonderful to be in your presence and I truly appreciate the opportunity to present to you all. Um, I am definitely new to the group. Um, I have a colleague who lives in New York and she pointed me in the direction of this group. So I'm really, really um, excited and appreciative to be here. Um, thank you, Violet, for uh, a lot for your communication and just making sure I stayed in the loop. I really, really appreciate that as well. Um, as Violet shared, my name is Heather Robinson. I am the president and CEO of an edu education consulting firm called Cross and Dot LLC. Uh, but I also um, recently, I, I just moved into full-time business in July of 2019. Eight years For the eight years prior to that, I was the executive director of Georgia Connections Academy, which is the nation's um, highest performing kindergarten through 12th grade virtual public charter school. So we are um, based in Georgia. We, we used, or I used to serve students uh, in all 159 school districts in Georgia. And we've been doing the full-time virtual learning for a long time. So uh, here we are. And everybody is now um, doing virtual learning in some respect. We have um, students who have been thrust into learning this way, and we have teachers who have been thrust into learning this way. And one of the things that I always said is, uh, when I was leading my school, is that students come first, teachers come second, and everyone else just has to find their place. And so all of the information that we've heard so far, I think just falls really in line with that. I loved both presentations, and I learned a lot. I took a lot of good notes to share uh, with some of my client schools and agencies as well. Today, I want to focus on professional learning, and we're going to talk about what professional learning kind of looked like for teachers in your traditional classrooms yesterday, what it looks like today, and what I hope that it looks like tomorrow. And I heard someone say earlier that teaching is now changed. It's official. I will ne it'll never go back to the way it was, but I hope that we take all of the wonderful lessons that we're learning now to support our classroom teachers in a virtual um, environment. So when I first started out at Georgia Connections Academy, one of the things that I said, and I didn't remember saying this, but one of my uh, colleagues reminded me that I did, uh, and that was that virtual schooling requires a reinvention of the profession of teaching, which will require our leaders to rethink the professional learning and support for all teachers moving forward. It's an exciting time to be an educator and an educational leader, but it's a little bit scary too. And I think we're all in that place right now where it's really exciting and teachers are probably on learning overload, but it's a little bit scary too, because we're trying to keep our students moving forward. We wanna make sure that when we do, if we do get back to our traditional classrooms, that they're ready for whatever is coming next. And so I think that is, um, that's where we are. So I wanna start and talk about yesterday. So yesterday, um, a traditional classroom teacher would be using digital resources to support instruction. So they knew they were trained and got professional development on how to use virtual resources, maybe inside or outside of the classroom, um, and maybe some basics of managing data. But for the most part, your students were in front of you and you were able to look in their eyes and know whether they got it. You're able to um, assess them formatively and summatively all along the way in a very direct manner. And so here we are now. Almost all of our face-to-face -face teachers are now working remotely in some way. And I wanna talk about what they need in terms of professional development right now, and maybe a little bit of what they don't need right now as well. Today, and I think we've heard it a couple of times, that the most important thing that they need from their leaders is positive energy and some gracious flexibility. Everybody is in a position of trying to make this happen and trying to do it with fidelity. So I think that's, that it's important as leaders that we stay positive, we show them positivity, and we also are gracious in how they're getting their job done. Um, one of the things that I think is the most important and that we sometimes forget uh, is that professional learning today needs to be focused on direct instruction. Our teachers are very well versed in knowing how to sit in front of a group of kids physically and make sure that the learning continues. That is a very different type of pedagogy when you are learning remotely. And if you're going to provide professional learning today, 
that needs to be part of that conversation. Um, also, some things that you may want to not do is minimize the number of platforms. My own students, my own children are learning remotely now. And one of the things that is frustrating me is we have to hop from this to that to this. Minimize the number of platforms. If you can find one that works, stick with that. Also, minimize the meetings. Some things can be sent in an email and everything doesn't have to be a meeting. We don't want to fill our teacher's day with a lot of administrivia, which virtual schooling can sometimes lend itself to. So if we can send it in an email, let's do that. Also, you want to provide some PD and data management. How do I know that my students are learning? If they're not in front of me, how can I take that information that I'm getting virtually and turn that into real information? Providing your teacher's PD on that is essential. And then lastly, just some things that some communication that they need to hear from you. What's the grading protocol? How are students going to be graded, assessed, and promoted to the next grade? What does attendance look like in a virtual school when I'm remote? When they're in my classroom and sitting in that desk, I know they're present. How do we know as a school or how have we decided as a school that they were present on any school day? And then finally, communication. How will we communicate with each other? There's been a lot of conversation about uh, teachers meeting together or keeping that community strong. They need to hear that from you. How will we keep our community strong? And now let's talk a little bit about tomorrow. So after we've all gone back to our classrooms or gone back to uh, the traditional way that we're used to, to doing school, we've got to recognize that we're moving into a new era for teacher because now teachers have a different set of credentials. Now, you, we used to have teachers who only taught face-to-face, -face, a few teachers who knew how to do virtual instruction, and now every teacher knows how to do both. So how do we maximize that new learning that teachers have and that new level of expertise that teachers are by default going to get after this is all over? One of the things that I strongly recommend is that you start thinking about a professional learning um, plan now that integrates that planned pedagogy for virtual instruction. Not in anticipation, though it might be that we are going to do this again, but let's leverage what we've learned and let's use that in our traditional classrooms to innovate a little bit. And then invest in a learning management system. Like I said, all those different platforms are very hard for everyone to manage. So investing in one place is a great way to spend some resources as you plan for tomorrow. I think someone also said it earlier. Uh, I think the gentleman from Rhode Island, I love that they had an operations manual. They had a documented process and procedure for how they were going to do this. That's crucial. If you haven't done that before you go back to school, have that in place for next year. And finally, start considering some different ways of learning. Staggered schedules is a huge conversation here in Georgia now. Uh, the four-day school week, three-day school week is becoming a very hot conversation. Have those conversations for tomorrow and decide how school is going to look for you all. So just wanted to share those pointers uh, and share some of my reflections that I'm hearing from the school leaders and the school agencies that I work with here in Georgia. If I can provide any additional resources for you, or if you just want to have a conversation, please don't have, hesitate to reach out to me. You can connect with me in just about any way that, that's out there to connect. Uh, but thank you so much for your time, and I am looking forward to hearing the rest of the presentations. Thank you, Heather. That was awesome. Thank you so much. Um, all right, now we're going to turn to um, California to hear from Ryan Bradford um, from YWP.I Schools. So Ryan, go for it. Hey, everyone. Um, Heather, can you let go of the screen share? There we go. I got something to show you guys. Um, this is the awkward time where we try to figure out where it is. There we go. All right, cool. Um, yeah, so as Violet said, uh, I am from Los Angeles. So I heard someone earlier say the afternoon, we're still in our uh, morning time. Um, I wanna share with you guys today some ways that my department is helping teachers remotely. Um, so yeah, let's get into it. So basically this is how your IT team can support teachers remotely. And I know the moment that I say IT, somebody is already doing this. Um, We've also been watching a lot of Office for our own mental health. I um, read a book about it, it was great. Um, but everything I'm gonna give you guys today is I think stuff that's pretty easy to implement um, and I'll give you some resources on how to do it. So my department basically came up with kind of five main things when we first started uh, transitioning to remote teaching. 
Um, the first question we asked ourselves is, okay, a lot of IT work is sometimes just putting your hands onto the computer, playing around with it, trying to figure it out. But how do we do that when we can't physically be in the same spot? Um, so we decided to use a tool called Chrome Remote Desktop. Um, it's totally free. It's through Google. Um, the only requirement is that the users have to have a Google account. Um, and we use Google Meet, but you could do this with Zoom too. So a lot of times what we do is we will jump on a call, either a Meet or a Zoom call uh, with the teacher, or even we've been doing this with some families, um, show them how to use the remote desktop tool. And then from our own homes, we're able to troubleshoot their tools. Um, again, completely free. It's web-based. Um, one of the pieces that I personally love the most about it is it's very transparent um, from the end user side. They have to give you permission. They could end it at any time because I know the idea of someone remotely managing your computer uh, can be kind of scary. <laughs> totally understand that. Um, so that's a really helpful tool that we've been using. And I think I had one or two teachers even use it to kind of help kids navigate some stuff in like Google uh, Classroom and such. Uh, so the second question we asked ourselves is, okay, we're going to all be spread apart. How do we make it easy for our staff to access important information and updates? Um, if you have Chromebooks, this is really easy because you can do a lot of management with Chromebooks. Um, if you don't, how do you do that? So we've been kind of treating the Chrome browser like a Chromebook. Um, so this might get really kind of nerdy and techy, um, but there is an option if you have uh, G Suite with your school uh, to do Chrome user management. So what we've been able to do is up here, you can see I have this bookmarks folder. Um, that is a set of bookmarks that we push out. So if there's important links that we need people to get, um, we just push it directly to their browser. We're also able to do extensions, um, updates, all sorts of stuff for them, just to make it easier for the teachers. Cause I know, you know, I'll, having taught, somebody will send something, hey, that look, especially right now with everything, um, that looks really cool, I wanna do that, but then just a whole bunch of stuff happens and you never get around to it. So we've been trying to simplify things by kind of being like, hey, just open it up, it's there for you, uh, you're ready to go. The only downfall of this one so far is it does require people to sign in and have their sync turned on. Um, so we've done a lot of education with our staff about uh, that. And it's been pretty easy once we get them in there. Um, so kind of the third question that we had was, all right, we're gonna have people remotely. We know that staff is gonna to wanna to contact parents and students, you know, probably using the phone because not everyone in our area has internet access. Um, so how do we do this without having staff members give out their personal phone numbers? Uh, we had a few people try, you know, the star 67 trick, but parents see blocked numbers and weren't answering them. Uh, so we partnered up with a group called Amplified IT. Um, and what they're doing right now is they're giving Google Voice numbers, um, which if you're not familiar with Google Voice, it is a system that basically gives you a phone number that you can call and text from, um, either from the web or an app on your phone. Uh, and Amplified has been awesome. Typically, Voice is a very short trial, but they've been able to get this trial extended through July 31st. Um, and then if you need to continue after that, they even have a discount on the uh, sticker price that Google tells you. Um, we've also been setting up extra like lines for uh, parent support and such, um, you know, because we know the teachers get inundated with a ton of questions from parents and students. Um, so for each of our school sites, we have a tech support line that goes to our on-site technician. So if a teacher doesn't know how to solve a problem, they can easily tell the kid, hey, call this number. And then one of my um, people who's on-site can actually help them with that. Um, that's kind of more of the techie stuff. Some of this other stuff just gets into some sort of uh, system changes that we've made to help. Um, so we kind of asked ourselves, okay, we know that people are gonna have questions. We're pretty lucky um, that most of our staff is pretty tech savvy, um, some more than I even knew. Um, but we still wanted to create a space for them to ask questions and then also to learn new tools or just refine the tools that they're already using. Um, like I nodded my head a lot when Heather said simplify keep it simple, use what you already know. Um, as much as I want to just throw a million and one things at them, I also know that it's overwhelming for the teachers, the students, everyone. Um, so we're, the way that we did this was we created daily office hours. So from three to four every day, I jump on a call and I'm just kind of sitting there. Um, staff, you know, some days it's really popular and everyone wants to jump in and ask questions. Sometimes I'm just in the background reading a book or surfing the internet. Um, but staff has commented that they like that, that they like that there's a set time that they know that they can get a hold of me or one or someone from my team to kind of discuss and troubleshoot things. Um, we've also been doing similar to this kind of virtual PD workshops. Uh, we sent out an interest survey with like a bunch of different options of what do people want to learn. 
and kind of use that to guide what we've been planning. Uh, and then what we're doing is we're just recording them, dropping them onto YouTube. So if you can't make it live, you have the link to watch later. And then the last one that we got here um, is that we also were looking at it long term. You know, this is it's the fateful Friday the 13th when we got the, hey, starting next week, you guys have to go completely remote. Um, and so one of the things that me and my team have been thinking of is, okay, how do we curate all of these resources, these tools, these updates? How do we just put everything into one spot to make it very simple for people to find and even for our own historical records? Um, so we just, we create a simple Google site. Um, I'll share the link with you guys. Feel free to steal from it. Um, you know, we're curating tools, tricks, tips. We have a form up there for people to submit stuff. Um, we also use Slack as an internal communication tool. And in there, we're encouraging at the school sites all the time, like celebrate what's working, uh, learn from each other. You know, there's the whole idea of the better together. And we really believe that right now because yeah, no one's an expert. It's kind of an uh, interesting time. Um, so that was it. If you guys have any questions, there's my email. Um, there's also a Calendly link. So if anything that was in here you're curious about and want to get more information, uh, we can set up a time to do a web call. Um, I'm also going to share with you guys, instead of the slides, this document that I put together that has some of the resources, whether it be videos or links or stuff that we shared with our staff. Um, so that way you guys can take what we have. And if you have anything awesome that your IT department is doing, please share with me. We love to steal. Thank you, guys. Thanks so much. That was great, Ryan. Um, and we'll also have all of these things posted on our website so you guys can just visit and download them. Um, okay, so next we are going to hear from Colin Hogan from Learning Community Charter School in New Jersey. Colin, go for it. Okay, hi everybody. Um, I'm Colin Hogan. I am from uh, Learning Community Charter School. We are located in um, Jersey City. Uh, we are the one of the first charters that was ever started in uh, New Jersey and we are the two things about us is that we are um, for pre-k through eight school we are one of the highest performing schools in the state and the most diverse school in the state and because New Jersey is one of the most diverse states in the country we may be one of the most diverse charters in the country so that being said um, we have a pretty diverse um, we have a really you know interesting uh, faculty, we have a fascinating student body, and we were really trying to think about when we did this, how do we preserve who we are in terms of our overall mission and vision as we move forward with uh, distance learning. Um, the school is um, one that the mission is, it's, it's long and wordy, but if I were to boil it down, what it is, is, is that kids are supposed to become uh, difference makers in their community through their time with us. That's our focus. And so as leaders, uh, what we always have to think about is, is when we do this sort of distance learning thing, there are so many things to think about, but where we direct our speech and our words matters. So thinking about how we kind of make this jump is critical. Like how do we take what meant for us and uh, keep it going? So um, over the summer, I was going from two, and I, I don't know whether, um, you know, perhaps if anyone's read this book, because it's you've got to read it. Um, over the summer, I was making my way between a conference in uh, DC all the way up to a conference in Boston. And uh, we were listening to this book in the car, um, The Art of Gathering by Priya Parker. She's actually uh, has a podcast right now, which is kind of relating to COVID-19. And what Priya Parker writes about in her book is about how you events that we have in our lives and you know full of referred in her podcast she said teachers are the ogs of gatherings right and that's true because we have events that happen all the time in school and there's all three things that you want to think about when you think about the gathering you want to think about how we're you know changed in the planning up for the gathering how the gathering itself changes us and how we're changed after the event happens so we were very focused on this, this thinking was sort of what anchored us as we forward and developing our different plan and pretty much everything that we've done since then. Uh, and so I think that it doesn't, you know, it's very uncertain what the future holds for all of us, 
So if you have a minute, I highly recommend you take a look at this book. It's, it's just great. So um, one of the things that we did was, is we thought a lot about our students, our families, and our faculty, and how could we preserve sort of the feeling of who we were in a distance learning environment? How do you capture sort of our secret sauce in what happens to us on a day-to-day -day basis? So one of the things that I thought was, well, I greet the students. We, we have a certain way that the students enter the building every day, as a lot of schools do. And so, um, you know, there's days when, you know, we're always, you know, we're always saying, welcome back. Uh, shaking their hands, not so much anymore, obviously. Um, and then on Thursdays, I do um, Positive Sign Thursday. Maybe you've seen that Twitter uh, campaign where you hold up a sign with uh, an important message on it. So we always do that too. And that's how the kids come to school. And then they're greeted by uh, their teachers once they're inside the building. It, 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 it's very warm. Um, and we're trying to think of a way that we could help our families feel that warmth at home. And so we came up with the idea, I mean, this is just very basic, Facebook Live, and um, I do the announcements every morning, but I try to really capture a lot of sort of what I'm doing with kids, uh, sort of, you know, on a daily basis. So here, you see, this is, I did this with spring break. Good morning, LCCS. Today is Thursday. Uh, April 16th. Jump up a little bit. And so I'm doing the pledge here. I'm giving shout outs to kids. Um, but most importantly, so what we did was because it was spring break, what we decided to do is we did a trip around the world because the fact was the kids couldn't go anywhere. So I kept, I keep announcements going even on days when we're not weekends, but days when we have, um, when we are not in session. Me and Pavid for figuring out that we are headed to. Egypt. Whoops. Oh, <laughs> look at this. Is this uh, from my old sixth grade classroom? It is not uh, to the test of time. I'm like uh, King Tut here. It is a tissue box. Look, you can, uh, if you're, there you we can go. get your so enough of that. There. So, you know, but we try to really like create that sense of enjoyment. And when we did our surveys with our families, they said that they really like that. It gives everybody a reason to get up in the morning. And that's what we want. We want to still capture who we are as much as possible. So there's a whole rhythm that we have in terms of doing the announcements. Um, the other thing is this, is that we want to keep the kids going as well. Our kids are very, are, are quite active and they're very involved with the, they, they, play a great role in running the school, and they're also really looking for things to do. So here you see my buddy Owen. Uh, I do this positive sign Thursday here. So this was about the census, so our sign was, so now I had the kids make the signs. I showed them a sign and I had them sign. So he made a sign for the census uh, to push doing it for census. So he made one for we count, that was our sign that day. And here you see my friend Camille. So last week what we did was our art teachers our teachers, and I'll show you some of the content that our teachers are producing. Our teachers produced a, a video about asking the students to make rainbows for healthcare providers. And so Camille made a rainbow and asked the kids to send me that. Giving our kids things to do and feeling like they're part of that, the culture of inclusion and volunteerism that's part of our school, even when we're not there, really makes a difference and keeps everybody going and enables us to all interact together a little bit more on different levels. Parker talks about little, big, small experiences, big things. So we've actually done virtual assemblies with 300, but we also have things like Camille making, you know, a rainbow with her markers. Um, and then the next thing is this, is that I think that what's been really important about this is that we've really encouraged the faculty to explode in terms of creativity. Um, so the day that we had, I, I had one day of training and then we were out on distance learning. And um, in this video, you're gonna see our music teacher and our, our band teacher. And this just came out today because we have teachers creating video content for the school at all times and it shows up on our Facebook page just to give people something fun to see. We all love to watch those fun videos, but it's even better. We find um, just through all of our surveys, people like it better when it's someone you know. So just take a look at this. This just came out today. And then I'll just say something quick about this.
Hi everybody. So I wrote a song and it's called Corona and its Fateful Days. And it's to the tune of Charlie on the MTA, which is one of our learning community charter school favorite songs. So Mike Brown is here to sing it with me. Mr. Brown. And I uh, hope you guys all sing along. All right, here we go. Well, let me tell you a story about a virus named Corona on some tragic and fateful days. It wreaked havoc on our cities, it wreaked havoc on our country, affecting people in so many ways. But will it ever go away? Yes, it will go away. And a cure Now, here's the thing about this. The teacher, on the day that we were um, getting ready, I mean, technology skills really, it's about the whole thing. But because of the feeling of wanting to have that sense of connection, now she's doing, I didn't even know that she learned how to do that app. So that's really like, you know, to do a split screen and do recording. I mean, that's, that's where we are with this. I mean, she told me she's creating virtual choirs. We're having apparently we're having concerts. Yeah. It's wild. So it's just really allowing people that opportunity to really express their, you know, all the things that they can do. And then finally, it's the community piece, which I think is really important. Um, so we have a couple things that are very important with our faculty. Uh, we assign sort of three people in the school that we just love, uh, and they do daily check-ins. Uh, but their daily check-ins um, are not just to maintain, it, that is to see, you know, how are you doing, but it's much more than that. It's, you know, inspirational, they provide, they send them seeds, adult coloring books, all sorts of things. It's a sense of for everybody to feel like they're being taken care of. And the assistant principal and I, we call faculty members randomly, just, we don't do Zoom, we do a lot of Zoom, let's face it, we all do. We do phone calls just to check in with people, just to see how you're doing, so people know that we're thinking about them. And then there's a lot of organic stuff that's been happening as well. faculty members start a 30-day uh, 5K challenge right after spring break. And that started this text thread, which is connecting everybody together and people are sharing ideas. And out of that, then there's like the 100 push-up challenge. People are sending words of support to people that are having a difficult time. There's now a playlist associated with it. It's, it actually has brought our faculty even closer together. Um, the faculty members have been pushing nonstop community drives for local healthcare workers, which has been really exciting for people to give people a sense of doing something. They've also been visiting students on their birthdays. Uh, that's been another thing that they've done for families that are doing this. And then uh, this comes, we're really excited because we always do a high honor roll breakfast. Just love that. And um, because we can't obviously get together, a team of people, we have we're going to be going around with donuts and bringing the donut to the kids so that they can have the high end breakfast. Uh, you know, we're bringing the breakfast to them. So these are ways that we take, you know, it goes back to that concept of Parker's about looking at sort of who you are and how do you take those sort of the essential important things about the feelings and the experiences that you have, observing them and redefining them and making people feel valued. Um, for families, kids, and students. And so we're, we're really proud of that, and it's been the thing that's really sustained through this difficult time. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Colin. That was awesome. Um, and The Art of Gathering is a great book. I highly recommend it to everybody as well. Um, okay, so now we are going to turn to our last presenter. Um, we're going to hear from Nayamka Long from Creative Minds International Public Charter School in Washington, D.C. Um, so Nayamka, go for it. Thank you. Hi, thank you, Violet, for the introduction. Um, I just want to say thanks again to CPICS for this opportunity to share. Um, I'm just encouraged by all the presenters and, you know, you can kind of get caught up on the news and how grim times um, seem right now, but just I'm just encouraged by the educators on the call and all the great things that are coming from this. Um, that just continues to um, inspire me for the work that we all do. I'm going to share my screen with you. Okay. 
Um, so from Creative Minds in Washington, D.C., we're a charter school. We're, this is at work in our ninth year in operation. Um, at our school, the center of what we do, which is so important, is we've just realized the importance of relationships. And, you know, all of our team is really in it for what we can do to support students. But realizing that in order for us to be there and really show up for our students, the teachers have to feel cared and supported for. And we been able to do a really good job when we're in school together and see each other every day. So we had to figure out what are those things that we were doing while we were in school? How do we translate and do those things remotely? These are some things that we've um, done. We started with a, a wellness survey and that was just going to be an opportunity for us to hear from our staff like what are the things that you're grappling with? What are the things that you need um, in order to feel supported? Um, and we got a lot of great information from this. I mean, it showed us that the main thing that our, our teachers were concerned about was our students, which kind of really goes back to that relationship piece and how they really had that connection and um, really felt that they were more concerned about their students than they were for themselves. Um, and got a lot of great information from that survey that helped us kind of figure out other ways that we could connect with our staff. Um, we had weekly grade level team meetings in when we were um, in the building together. From the survey, we found that our teachers really wanted to continue that practice. Um, and this is just a sample of one of our meetings that we actually had today. Um, we always have a, like a check-in and usually it's something funny to get us started. And we also just wanna kind of see how they're doing their mental capacity because that's also so important and any shout outs that we have for the team. Everyone wants to feel valued and it's nice to hear those um, if you may be living alone and not having that daily connection with adults. Um, we just have opportunity to provide updates from the team, checking in on students, and also always having opportunity for us to kind of share in a community what's working well so that we're not trying to reinvent every single day, but we're sharing good practices that are happening. And these meetings have been going really well. Um, next up, we talked about setting realistic expectations for our teachers um, during this time. We have some teachers who um, live alone and have a lot of time and opportunity to plan various things. We also have some teachers who have two or three children at home. They're trying to navigate their children's home learning. So we set kind of a, a guidance so that teachers weren't feeling overwhelmed or unsure of what the expectation was from leadership around what they wanted to do. So we kind of created this plan for K through four and early childhood, and we also have one for middle school, just as a way so that teachers kind of had some idea of what the expectations were, realizing that leadership was not, realizing that this was gonna be a transition for all. We wanted to make sure that we had clear guidelines so that they weren't feeling like they weren't doing a good job, but you know, kind of meeting what we were expecting them to do. Um, we continued with staff meetings, although we didn't find those as productive because it was hard to have all our team members see each other in the Zoom. So we do uh, fewer opportunities of those um, large gatherings because we find the more grade level team meetings, more we can connect with our staff members. And also, if anyone doesn't show up on those calls, we can just check in, send them a text, is everything okay? Just, we missed you during this time. Not as a kind of making sure you need to be at these meetings, but just a general concern about their well-being. We also had weekly teacher notes that we send out. Um, and this is just kind of as someone said, we don't always have to have a meeting, but if there's some communication that we wanna share with the team, we can just put this in. Um, so these come out every uh, Monday morning. So it's just kind of reminders, announcements for the week, things that we want to make sure that staff members are aware of. Like I said, we wanna keep those meetings to a minimum, but we wanna make sure that our staff stays informed. Um, Instagram posts, that's just another way where our teachers are um, sharing things that they're doing, continuing that personal connection um, with the students um, has just been another fun way of, to do that. Um, book club is something that we started, continuing to educate our teachers and having us come together to do book clubs and also virtual games. Um, this is just, I uh, wanted to share this. This is something that we, at the start of all of our team meetings, we have different pictures and we have the staff kind of say how they're feeling. 
just gives us some insight on, you know, those teachers we need to check back up on and see how they're doing. Um, we always revisit our core values, you know, teachers uh, with this poll, I'm not sure if you're familiar with this, but this is a fun way for us to kind of get feedback on how our teachers are doing. This is another one, we're, we're all working remotely. This is kind of fun bingo game that we've played one of the times. So just trying to keep it fun and letting our teachers know that we're here for them to support them. Um, and that's it. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. That was great. I love that bingo. It looks really fun. Um, all right, so we have nine minutes left. So I'm just going to open it up for Q&A. Um, <coughs> this is Brian Rossi in Minneapolis. I was curious about um, what the survey was, CMI, I think. What, what was that, Nayamka? Sure, I can um, share the survey. I'll add it in the link here. I'll, I'll add it to the chat so you can have it. And that's a, a copy so that you can utilize that. Um, you can just make a copy of it and use it. And you can also just an put your answers in there just to kind of see the questions that are asked. Super, thank you. All right, well, if we don't have any more questions, um, I'm just gonna formally close it. But if folks wanna stay on and discuss anything, we can keep the Zoom room open for a few more minutes. Um, so thank you guys all for coming. As always, it was wonderful. We're gonna have another meeting in two weeks on May 15th. Um, and that one is going to be highlighting student voices. So we're bringing in a lot of students from all around the country to share what their experience has been. So hopefully all of you guys can come to that and hear from students. Um, and in the meantime, as always, let us know if we need anything. And thank you guys so much for coming. Thank you, Violet. Thank you, everyone. Happy weekend. Thank you, Richard. Same to you.